Welcome to the third of four lectures on power system planning. I'm Hyde Merrill. This lecture is on strategic and least cost planning. We will begin by presenting a fundamental model for strategic planning. We will show how to solve the three principal problems of strategic planning. Resolving conflicting objectives between various stakeholders, considering an expanded set of options, and managing uncertainty and risk. First, the fundamental strategic planning model. For the power system, we are interested in selecting among options or plans in the pres presence of uncertainties or futures in such a way as to resolve the conflicting objectives of the various stakeholders. These objectives are measured in attributes. First, let's talk about options. Strate strategic planning considers supply and demand options. Conventional coal, gas, and hydro plants, purchases and sales, demand side management, distributed generation, and other smart grid options. It also considers transmission options, mergers, acquisitions, diversification, and least cost planning is a special case of strategic planning. It's strategic planning only for supply and demand options. There are two models of uncertainty. The first is familiar to all engineers, probabilistic models. I won't go into it for, into probabilistic models further. There's a competing or a comp complementary model, a class of models known as unknown but bounded models. Unknown but bounded models assume that an uncertainty has limits, but that we don't have or use a probability distribution function uh, within those limits. Unknown but, unknown but bounded models are useful if you don't know the probabilities. For instance, the probability of high load growth versus load growth, low load growth, and if you don't know the correlations among various uncertainties. Unknown but bounded models are also, also useful in situations where the law of large numbers doesn't apply. For example, the Three Mile Island disaster was vanishingly improbable, but it still happened. And unknown but bounded models are used to anticipate unlikely but high impact futures. Let's talk about plans and futures. A plan is a vector which is made up of a decision, yes or no, regarding every option. For example, one plan would be to build three combined cycle plants, no coal plants, and implement an aggressive load management program. A future is also a vector. It's a realization of every uncertainty. For example, one future would be high demand growth with medium fuel costs and with no new air quality regulations. There's a number of stakeholders, classes of stakeholders, who care about power sector plans. They each have their objectives, and these objectives are measured in attributes. For instance, you have electrical customers, investors, neighbors, employees. And the electric customers care about cost and reliability. The investors are concerned with risk and return. Neighbors care about environmental impact, employees, security, and so on, and taxpayers care about tax benefits and burdens. These objectives conflict, and a way of resolving these objectives is through a method known as trade-off analysis. Let me give you an example. We have a, a problem with seven plans and two attributes or objectives. One uh, attribute is cost, and the objective is to minimize the cost. Another attribute is greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and the objective is to minimize the greenhouse gas emissions. For these seven plans and the values of cost and greenhouse gas em emissions for each one of them can be planned on a two-dimensional axis. The vertical axis is cost. The greenhouse gas axis is on the horizontal, horizontal axis. And... Um, each of the plans is represented by a point on this, uh, in this space. 
Now, which plan is best? Well, it depends on what you care about. If you care about cost, then the plan on the lower right is the best. But in terms of greenhouse gases, that happens to be the worst. If you care about greenhouse gases, well, the plan that minimizes greenhouse gases is on the upper left. But that is also the highest cost plan. So how do you resolve the conflicting objectives? When there's in a situation when there is no optimal solution. That is, no solution that's optimal in terms of all of the attributes or all of the objectives. So what do you do in a case when there is no optimal solution? That is, no solution that's best in terms of both objectives. First, let's just document that the objective is to minimize the cost and to minimize the greenhouse gases. Now let's introduce the concept of a trade-off curve. The points on this trade-off curve are not optimal, but in a sense they are optimal. They're optimal because all of the interior points are clearly not optimal. Now why are they clearly not optimal? Well, for each interior point, there's a point on the trade-off curve which is better than that interior point in terms of both objectives. So everyone, the people who care about minimizing cost and the people who care about minimizing greenhouse gas emissions, would be willing to agree that the interior plants are not of interest. Now I said that all of the plants on the trade-off curve are in a sense optimal, but really none of them is truly optimal. But the plant or plants that are at the knee of the trade-off curve are the most interesting. And why is that? Well, start off at the lower right-hand corner of that trade-off curve, where you have high greenhouse gases and low cost. You can reduce the greenhouse gases dramatically with only a small increase in cost by moving toward the knee. And similarly, if you start at the upper left, where you have a low greenhouse gas plan, but it's very expensive, you can reduce the cost dramatically with only a minor increase in greenhouse gases by moving toward the knee. So the plans at the knee are not optimal, but they're more interesting. So. Let me review the principles that I just discussed. First, in trade-off for trade-off analysis, the interior plans are not of interest because each is dominated by a plan on the trade-off curve. That is, some plan on the trade-off curve is better for both attributes. Second principle, no plan on the trade-off curve is dominated. Third, the plans at the knee of the curve are the most interesting. And finally, an observation, and that is, Decision makers like these diagrams. Decision makers don't care about the details of the plans. What they care about is what's in it for them. That is, how does each plan, how do the plans compare to each other in terms of the things that the stakeholders care about? Here's a real example. This is a, a planning exercise for New York City and the surrounding area. And on this uh, graphic, there are two attributes measuring two objectives. On the vertical axis is cost of electricity, present worth of the cost of electricity in billions of dollars. On the horizontal axis, it's the annual, peak annual average ground level SO2 concentrations for the final year of the study. And the objective was to minimize cost of electricity and minimize SO2 concentrations. Well, let's see what these various plans are. On the lower right, an area indicated in the graph is Area Q, you have plans that involved massive construction and, and conversion of in-city oil-fired plants to coal, and PS, don't worry about installing scrubbers. So, cheap electricity, very dirty air. And the upper left was continuing to do what the utility was doing at the time, which was to burn French perfume. Very clean, pure oil with, uh, with low, uh, low emissions. And in the middle, around the knee of the trade-off curve, are plans that are more interesting. Here's another example. This is an example of a uh, transmission planning exercise. And in this graphic, on the vertical axis is corridor impact, which is a, a measure of environmental impact. And on the uh, horizontal axis is capital requirements. And the objective was to minimize corridor impact and also to minimize capital requirements. And it turned out that there was one plan which minimized corridor impact and capital requirements. There are over a thousand plans represented here, 
The one plan that minimizes both of those is, not surprisingly, do nothing. But it turned out there were other attributes that were of interest. For instance, operating costs and loss of load probability. Again, the objective was to minimize operating costs and minimize LOLP. And it turned out that there were seven plans on the lower left, which minimized both of those. And those plans, not surprisingly, were variations of the aluminum sky. Build everything. So if you compare the conclusions from these two diagrams, the first one says build nothing, and the second one says build everything. And just to muddy the waters more, here's another comparison. The vertical axis is present worth of operating costs, and the horizontal axis is capital requirements. Here there's a trade-off curve. There's no plan that minimizes both of these attributes simultaneously, but there is a knee of the curve. So conclusion number one from this. I've showed you five attributes on three graphics. There's actually a sixth. You can't resolve a multiple attribute problem on two-dimensional paper. It simply cannot be done. What we're looking at here is projections, not even cuts, but projections. But it turns out that the mathematics for finding a trade-off curve and finding the knee of a trade-off curve are easily applied to any number of dimensions. You can't visualize them. You can't sh show them graphically, but there's mathematics that's available for finding a trade-off surface, not a curve, it's in multiple, multiple dimensional space, it's a surface, and look to find the knee of that surface. These mathematics were applied to this problem, and these two plans turned out to be at the knee of a six-dimensional trade-off surface. They also happen to be at the knee of this two-dimensional trade-off surface. In terms of the immediately previous trade-off curve we looked at. Those two plans are here. And in terms of the first curve we looked at, the same two plans are here. Now, isn't that interesting? Those plans that are at the knee of the multiple dimensional trade-off surface, the six-dimensional trade-off surface, aren't optimal in any sense. They don't minimize any of the attributes, but they're quite close to the minimum for all of the attributes. So in terms of a compromise that all of the stakeholders can live with, these plans are good. How do you do trade-off analysis? Well, for trade-off analysis, for more than two attributes, you can't find the trade-off curve and the knee graphically. There's a simple algorithm for finding the trade-off curve for any number of attributes. And there's also an algorithm that's slightly more complex for finding the knee of the trade-off curve, and it works for any number of attributes as well. Here's the algorithm for finding the trade-off curve or the trade-off surface. What you do is you simply compare all pairs of plans. If one plan of, of a pair is dominated by the other, it's an interior plan, and you drop it. When you get through doing the comparison, the trade-off surface consists of all of the plans that have not been dropped, that have not been dominated, all of the plans that are not interior plans. Here's an example. This is from a study done by an uh, utility in New England. Uh, each row is a different plan. There are three attributes represented here. The objective is to minimize each of those attributes. The first one is the cost of electricity. Of course, the ratepayers care about that. Uh, oil dependence, that was a national strategic issue. This plan, this study was done about the time of the Arab oil crisis. And we were interested in, in reducing our dependence on foreign oil and of course perceived investor risk. So let's follow the algorithm in the previous slide. Let's compare every pair, pair of plans. And the way we'll do that is we'll start with plan A at the top of the list and we'll compare it to each of the plans below it to see if A dominates or is dominated by plan B, then B1, then B2, B3, and so on. Then we'll go up to plan B and we'll compare plan B to each of the plans below it, then B1 and so on. And when we get through, we will have compared all possible, all possible pairs of plans. Okay, let's compare plan A to plan B. Let's see. Plan B has lower cost of electricity than A. Plan B has less oil dependence than A. And investor risk is the same. And so the investor doesn't care about either one of those plans as opposed to the other. So as a result, we can say, and nobody will argue with this, not the rate payer, not the President of the United States, not the investor, the plan A is dominated by plan B. 
I said we were, comp- we were going to compare plan A to everything below it. We just did. Because once a plan is dominated, and it stays dominated, and, uh, and it doesn't need to be compared further. Now let's compare plan B to all of the plans below it. Let's see. B to B1. B1 is cheaper than B, lower cost, lower, lower oil dependence than B, and lower risk than B, and therefore plan B1 clearly dominates B. So B is no longer of interest. Now we'll compare plan B1 to each of the plans below it. We can compare B1 to B2. Let's see, B1 has lower cost of electricity than B2, but B2 has less oil dependence than B1. So neither one of those two plans dominates the other. Now let's compare B1 and B3. We're comparing B1 to all the plans below it. B1 to B3, B1 has lower cost than B3. It has lower oil dependence than B3 and lower risk than B3. Therefore, B3 is dominated and doesn't need to be considered anymore. I won't complete this example. I'll leave it to you as a homework exercise to complete the example. Uh, The answer is that there are a small handful of plans that are on the trade-off surface, but uh, there are two of those plans, of those handful of plans, that are on the knee of the multidimensional trade-off surface. Okay, there are four theorems that have been proved with regard to trade-off analysis. The first theorem is every problem has a trade-off surface. Second theorem is the trade-off surface is unique. It doesn't matter how you find it. It doesn't matter what order you sort through those plan by plan, uh, pair by pair comparisons, you'll always come up with the same answer. Every trade-off surface has a knee. There's an asterisk associated with this theorem. There are some qualifiers with regard to how you define a knee. Chosen those quali- choose, by choosing those qualifiers appropriately, every trade-off surface has a knee. And the knee is unique. Again, an asterisk. You can make the knee bigger or smaller, but the, but the knee itself is unique. Now, there's another method to deal with uh, multiple objective problems, and that is to optimize something called a utility function. That is to convert a multi-objective problem into an optimization problem. Here's an example. What you do is you choose a plan, X, a vector, which each element of the vector is a decision with regard to one of the options. You choose a vector which minimizes the utility function. J is a function of X, and that utility function is some coefficient k1 multiplied by the attribute SO2 emissions, for example, plus another coefficient k2 multiplied by the attribute operating cost, plus k3 times capital cost, plus k4 times quarter impact, plus etc., etc., etc. Now, what's the problem with this approach? Well, there are several, but the most significant problem, the absolute deal breaker is, the apples to oranges coefficients k1 do not exist the reason they do not exist is because the attributes are fundamentally incommensurate let's now look at risk and uncertainty risk is not a separate attribute it's the hazard to which stakeholders are exposed because of options and uncertainties in other words in order to have risk you have to have a decision among options, and you have to uncertainties, have uncertainties. If there's no decision, there's no risk. If there are no uncertainties, there's no risk. Here are three measures of risk. Robustness is the possibility. It might be the probability or it might just be a possibility, but it's the possibility of not regretting choosing one plan instead of another. Regret is the possible adverse attribute values for a plan due to uncertainties. In other words, regret recognizes the decision and the uncertainties. And it says a particular combination of a decision and an uncertainty may lead to adverse attribute values. And finally, another measure of risk is exposure. And exposure is the futures for which a plan would be regrettable. If it turns out that there's no future for which a plan is regrettable, then the plan is 100% robust and there's no regret. Usually we don't have that happy event. Let me show you a case where we do. This is an example of a robust plan, robust in terms of cost versus SO2 concentrations. This again is back to the New York City study I referred to earlier. A key uncertainty was load growth. 
everybody agreed that it was probably not going to be more than 1% per year, and probably was not going to be less than minus 1% per year. And this graphic shows 22 plans, the cost and the air CO2 emissions, for each of the 22 plans with 1% load growth and with minus 1% load growth. And notice that the uncertainty in load growth has a tremendous effect on the attributes. So the, the uncertainty affects the attributes. But interestingly, the, att the plans that are remote from the knee of the curve at plus 1% are also remote from the knee of the curve at minus 1%. Most interestingly, the plans that are at the knee of the curve at plus 1% load growth are also the plans at minus 1% load growth. This is a powerful result. What this says is that you don't have to resolve the uncertainty in load growth. That whatever you do that looks good relative to the other plans, if the load growth is 1%, will also look good if the load growth is minus 1%. So there's no risk associated with the load growth uncertainty. That is a wonderful result. Now, usually the results of risk analysis aren't quite so happy. So how do you manage risk? Well, there's a classical approach, which is you choose the plan that minimizes the maximum regret. That's called the Minimax plan. The problem is that this only works for one attribute problems. Why doesn't it work if you have more than one attribute? It doesn't work if you have more than one attribute because the plan that minimizes the Minimax plan for cost of electricity, let's say, might not be the same plan that minimizes the maximum regret for SO2 emissions. So how do you deal with problems that have more than one objective? For multiple objective problems, what you do is you do trade-off analysis on regret. Either way, you don't stop with just doing the analysis and quantifying the, the risk. You look for hedges to reduce exposure and regret. Now, the investment community talks about hedges all the time, and hedges are financial instru instrument. In power system planning, strategic planning, hedges aren't necessarily financial hedges. They can be physical hedges or, or other types of hedges. Here are some examples of hedges. Suppose there's risk associated with load growth uncertainty. A way to hedge that risk is to build small power plants instead of big ones and small power plants with short lead times. Now, there's a cost to this. This is an insurance policy. It is maybe you'd like to build a big bit plant and take advantage of the economies of scale, but you don't know what the load growth is going to be. Now, if the load growth turns out to be soft, then you'll have an excess capacity situation, which you don't like. If you build small plants, dollars per kilowatt, they're probably a little bit more expensive, but they reduce the risk because you have short lead times and you can wait until load growth future is a little more clear before you make the decision on each of the plans. Another hedge against load and generation uncertainty is to string single circuit lines on double circuit towers and if the lines happen to be EHV lines to insulate those lines when they're built for possible conversion later to direct, to direct current. The direct current lines have greater transfer capability but unless you need that excess, excess capability you don't need the, ex the extra cost. But if you insulate the circuits when the lines are built for direct current conversion later, that direct current insulation is only slightly more expensive than the AC insulation. It doesn't cost very much to do it in the, in the beginning. But if you have to go back later and re-insulate those lines, that's expensive and that's a hassle. Another example of a hedge. Central America wanted to build a high voltage line linking the six countries they went to the Inter-American Development Bank to borrow money for this line. The Inter-American Development Bank did a risk analysis, and they determined that the key uncertainty was whether or not an international market for power would develop in that region. If there were no international market for power, then the line would be useless. And so they hedged that risk by approving the line only conditionally. And the condition precedent was the bank would not provide the funds for the line until a market was established and running within the limits of the existing interconnections, which were quite weak and quite small. But what they insisted was that the six countries involved resolve the market issues first. And once the market issues were resolved, then they would provide the money for the line. Let me summarize. We've talked about strategic planning, a very powerful conceptual framework and methods for selecting among a wide range of options so as to resolve the conflicting objectives of the various stakeholders in a way to keep all of them reasonably happy in the presence of risk and uncertainty.
Before I sign off, I'd like to leave you, leave you with some sound bites. First, optimality is truly a delusion. There is usually no interesting problem. It has only one objective. And usually there's no plan that is optimal for all stakeholders. Second, planning usually is deterministic. We forecast a future and then we plan for that future. A general who did that would lose wars. The forecast is always wrong. To worry about one forecast and not look at alternative possibilities is a mistake. And finally, whenever you take an average, whenever you calculate an expected value, you lose information about risk. And then a parting observation, there's sometimes a difference between what we say and what we do. For example, in the planning pro protocol for one ISO in the United States, the following is, is found. Planning shall meet transmission needs on a reliable, economic, and environmentally acceptable basis. I did a little word search in the 330-page annual planning report produced by the same ISO. I looked for words like reliable or reliability, economic, and cost different forms of these words, environment, cultural, and scenic. I counted how many of those words there were. A 330-page report, there were 444 occurrences of various forms of the word reliable. There were 272 occurrences of various forms of the words economic and cost. There were 13 occurrences of words having to do with the environment. Thank you very much.